We're taught to help other people in need, but sometimes we don't even practice what we preach. When workers of an Apple store, which shares a wall with a Lululemon Athletica store, heard a woman's frantic pleas, they just shook their heads and went back to work. Little did they know a woman was begging for help as she was mercilessly attacked by a criminal. The following day, everyone got to know about the horrific and gruesome passing of Jaina Murray. But there's more to this case than meets the eye. What was the motive? Why was Jaina targeted? And what had Jaina done to be on the receiving end of such a grim attack? The case of Jaina Murray is alarming, twisted, and mind-blowing to no end. Jaina Murray was born on November 22, 1980, in Wichita, Kansas, to parents David and Phyllis Rosalind Murray. Growing up, Jaina had a hunger for adventure. She loved animals, dancing, and had volunteered all throughout her life. Her friends and family defined her as a girl with an infectious smile. Jaina loved to travel. In fact, she wanted to travel to all of the continents, and she ticked all of them off her list except for Antarctica. She was a young woman who loved excitement and she also filmed herself bungee jumping on the 30th birthday. She was also a hard worker and excelled in school, which led her to a scholarship in Madrid, Spain. There, she attended St. Louis University for two years before graduating with a Bachelor of Science from George Washington University in DC. Jaina, not wanting to stop there, earned a double master's degree in communication and business administration from Johns Hopkins University in Washington, DC a little bit later on. Her master's thesis was on Lululemon Athletica, a high-end yoga and athletic brand, so it was only fitting that she applied for a job there. Lululemon loved her knack for cutthroat business, and given her past work experience, Jaina was immediately hired. In 2011, Jaina was working as a sales team leader for the Lululemon store in Bethesda, Maryland, and she was nearing the completion of her double master's degree. All the while, Jaina was also in a relationship with her longtime boyfriend, Frazier Bosell. Unbeknownst to Jaina, at this time, Frazier was looking at engagement rings to propose to Jaina. All in all, things were amazing in Jaina's life. She had the perfect job, was thriving in school, and was about to start a new chapter in her life with the person that she loved. Unfortunately, Jaina wouldn't live long enough to say yes to Frazier, because on the fateful day of March 11, 2011, everything would horrifically change. Oh, jeez. This boy got a lot bigger since the last Raycon sponsorship. Oh, jeez. Here's the thing. Oftentimes, things that are supposed to just work often don't. Take this guy, for example. He's turned into a big boy, but he don't work for nothing. He's supposed to be out trimming the pasture with all the other goats, but instead he's in here being a lazy lump, causing me to be out of breath. But you know what always works when I ask it to, and what never acts like a lazy lump? My Raycon Everyday Earbuds. Raycon Everyday Earbuds make your everyday just a little bit easier. These earbuds have an active ergonomic design and multi-point connectivity. That means you can connect them to multiple devices at once, and they even offer active noise cancellation. They're also available in tons of vibrant colors, and my personal favorite is probably this green color, which I think complements their yellow case quite nicely. And the fact that wireless charging still works through the case well, that's just a bonus. So whether you're out frolicking with the goats, slinging poop in the barn, or just laying around on the couch, the Raycon Everyday Earbuds have you covered. These earbuds are super comfortable, and honestly, they fit me a little better than my other earbuds that cost three times the price. These earbuds are excellent for using at the gym or when you're out and about, because they don't constantly try to slip out of your ear. My wife and I have both used Raycon Everyday Earbuds when working around the farm, listening to podcasts, or just hanging out around the house, and in fact, she basically confiscated them from me, so they're not even mine anymore. But they genuinely work great in just about every application. My wife has nothing but great things to say about them. The quick charge function that they offer is something we can't live without, because a quick 10-minute charge will give you up to 90 minutes of battery life, which is just amazing. Click the link in the description, or go to buyraycon.com slash tie not to get 20 to 50% off site-wide. That's right, up to 50% off everything on Raycon's website. And you go to buyraycon.com slash tie knot. Thanks to Raycon for sponsoring today's video. Now, I can go put this fat boy down, he heavy. March 12, 2011 was another day at work for the Lululemon store manager, Rachel. 
She arrived at the Bethesda location shortly before 8 a.m. to open up the store and set things up. Bethesda, Maryland was a relatively safe area, but as soon as she got to the door, she was stunned to see the door unlocked. Rachel immediately noticed that something was very wrong upon entering the store. The whole store was a mess. There were mannequins thrown on the ground, clothes were tossed everywhere, and horrifically, the floor, walls, and ceiling were spattered with blood. While trying to process what had happened in the store, Rachel heard something. Someone was moaning as if in pain. Rachel freaked out and exited the store in a state of shock, disbelief, and fear. Right next to the Lululemon store was an Apple store, and there was a huge line of people gathered for the release of the brand new iPad 2. One of the people waiting in line, named Ryan, noticed how worried Rachel looked, and he agreed to go in with her into the store to see what was wrong. As the pair made their way to the store, Ryan headed for the back, where the office, changing rooms, bathrooms, etc. were. The place was in complete disarray, and lots of bloody footprints were everywhere. But nothing could have prepared Ryan for what he saw next. In the office was a body, a woman with long blonde hair lying face down. As he was trying to make sense of what his eyes were seeing, he heard a moan coming from the bathroom. There was another woman who was tied up, her hands and feet bound by zip ties, and she was also injured, but luckily she was still breathing. Ryan immediately jumped into action and advised Rachel, who was still near the store entrance, to call 911. When emergency services arrived shortly after the call, they were greeted by the horrific scene in the store, and the most important task was to identify the two women. Unfortunately, the deceased woman was identified as 30-year-old Jana Murray. The woman who was still alive but was injured was 28-year-old Brittany Norwood, another sales assistant who joined six weeks prior to the tragic incident and had transferred from a sister store in Georgetown. Brittany had her hands and feet tied, and injuries were on her legs, chest, arms, face, and abdomen. Both women had holes cut into their pants, leading officers to assume that they'd been taken advantage of by the assailants. Immediately, Brittany was taken to the suburban hospital in Bethesda, as she was still miraculously alive but traumatized to no end. While Brittany was being taken care of at the hospital, the store was taped off, and the emergency officers took a closer look at Jaina. To say it was a brutal crime scene is an understatement. Jaina had almost 331 wounds on her body, with more than half of those being on her face and chest. The wounds were inflicted by six different weapons that were strewn across the store. The weapons seemed to have been taken from a toolbox, property of Lululemon, and they consisted of a hammer, box cutter, wrench, and a knife. Tied around Jaina's neck was a ligature that wasn't as tight as to indicate that it had been used against her, but it was strange nonetheless. Jaina's body was taken for an autopsy to figure out the cause of her passing, and her parents and boyfriend were informed about Jaina's sudden and tragic loss. To say that they were deeply, deeply struck by this does not even begin to explain it. Jaina's boyfriend and would-be fiancé was more than just devastated. The autopsy revealed that Jaina had fought for her life, and there were over a hundred different defensive wounds on her body. The fatal wound proved to be one on the back of her neck. Evidence suggested that she tried to escape the attack and was alive for most of the brutality, since the trail that she left behind led to the back door of the store. There was even blood on the emergency door handle, as well as a key slid into the door. A key that only Jaina had. The attack also lasted for approximately 20 minutes, which is just so disturbing to think that this young woman lived through this entire ordeal, and it just doesn't even make sense. It was a race against time for the police because they wanted to catch whoever had so violently attacked Jaina and Brittany. But there were a couple of roadblocks along the way. See, Lululemon didn't have any security cameras outside the premises, so it was impossible to see who could have gotten into the store. And this kind of seems a bit negligent on the brand's part, because let's say someone stole something from the store. Wouldn't you want to try to catch their license plate as they drove away? The only camera in close proximity was in front of the Apple store, so the police reviewed that footage from the night before. They did see two men dressed in dark clothing walking on the sidewalk, presumably towards Lululemon at the time when Brittany and Jaina were supposedly attacked. But since the camera was far away from the actual store, police weren't sure if those men actually had something to do with Jaina's passing and Brittany's injuries. The police took note of this detail, but they had no choice for now but to ask the only survivor, Brittany, for any information on what happened the night before. 
On the same day, Detective Dina Mackey from the Montgomery County Police Department went to visit Brittany, who was healing well since most of her injuries were superficial. Brittany, who was visibly flinching and cowering away from people's touches, finally opened up to Detective Mackey. Brittany said that on the evening of March 11, 2011, around 9 p.m., she and Jaina were in the closing shift. Jaina usually went to and from work in her car, whereas Brittany used the train. The women closed the store and went their respective ways. But once reaching the train station, Brittany realized that her Metro card was left at the store. She immediately called another store employee in hopes of getting Jaina's number because she had the keys to the store. And once getting it, Brittany called Jaina and explained her situation. Jaina, being the helpful person she was, turned around even though she was just about to reach home and went back to the store to help Brittany get her Metro card back. Once the two women reached Lululemon, Jaina had parked her car right outside the store because she assumed that she was going to quickly go in and out of the store. As Jaina unlocked the door at 10.05 p.m. with Brittany behind her, they were pushed in by two men wearing all black clothing, ski masks, and gloves. Detective Mackey thought that the attackers were the same men that were seen walking in the CCTV footage around the time of the attack. Brittany assumed that they were robbers and were going to leave them alone once clearing out the cash registers. But things took a tragic turn. Brittany went on to describe the assailants. The two men, one taller and one shorter, were probably in their mid-twenties, and she believed that they were Caucasian. The shorter guy attacked Brittany, whereas the taller one grabbed Jaina. They subdued the two women and proceeded to tell Brittany that they knew where she lived. See, Brittany had utility bills in her purse, which had her address on them. So it's safe to say where the robbers got the information from, as she also had her ID, which would have also shown her address. Brittany was visibly scared upon hearing this. She then went on to say that their pants were ripped and they were violated, in between getting attacked and being called racial slurs. She also heard Jaina scream and cry, but was unable to do anything. In the end, Jaina got quiet, and Brittany knew that Jaina had passed away. Brittany was horrified upon hearing Jaina's silence. She knew that the same fate would most likely befall her next, but as she was preparing for the worst, the attackers offered to spare her life. Why? Well, because she was, quote, fun to take advantage of. After the awful crime was over, the attackers tied up Brittany, took the cash, and left her in one of the bathrooms, where she was later discovered. Throughout the session with Detective Mackey, Brittany was incredibly hysterical and traumatized. It was decided to end the interview while the crime scene was being tested for forensic evidence, in hopes of finding the DNA of the two assailants. Meanwhile, the police decided to follow Brittany's lead and during a stakeout in front of the Lululemon store. They found the two mysterious men dressed in black and questioned them. But the police hit a dead end soon after this encounter. The two men were actually waiters from a nearby restaurant, and they used the same route every day to go back home, since they both lived in the same area. But what about their dark clothing? Well, the black clothes were their waiter's uniform, and after reviewing a lot of CCTV footage from the previous nights around the same time, the two men were seen walking every day down the same sidewalk. They also had airtight alibis at the time that Jaina's attack took place, and they even gave their DNA willingly to help the investigation, while also providing prints for the shoes that they wore. All of this evidence was sent for cross-referencing with crime scene photos. Fast forward to March 16th, 2011, and Brittany was called in for another interview for more information. During the interview, detectives asked whether they knew what type of car Jaina drove. Brittany answered in the negative and was allowed to go home after routine questions. The next day, Brittany's siblings contacted the police to tell them that Brittany had something to tell them about the car. They said that Brittany was scared to reveal more information about the car because she was terrified that the attackers would come after her again. Two days later, on March 18th, Brittany was called in for yet another interview, and this time she confessed that she knew what Jaina's car looked like because the robbers had made her move it. See, before forcing themselves on Brittany, the attackers ordered her to move Jaina's car away from the store. They apparently threatened her that she was being watched and that she would be killed if she didn't come right back. While moving Jaina's car alone, Brittany also saw a police officer on patrol, but she didn't flag him down in fear that she would get caught since the suspects knew where she lived. But interestingly, the police began to believe that Brittany was not telling them the whole truth. Remember the violation claim in both Jaina and Brittany having slashed pants? Well, six days into the investigation, the forensic reports came back, and what they revealed was unbelievable. The reports concluded that neither of the women had been taken advantage of. 
When the crime scene was scouted for evidence, the only DNA found all over the place belonged to Jaina and Brittany. There was no male DNA at the crime scene, or on Jaina or Brittany for that matter. As an extra step, the DNA taken by the two waiters wasn't found in the store or on the women, so they were off the suspect list. Moreover, the footprints said a lot about Brittany's story. First of all, the footprints were only found inside the store. If the attackers came from the outside, there would have been a trail of footprints outside the store too, but there was nothing. There could be only one of two explanations for this bizarre clue. Either the attackers changed their shoes before leaving, which is highly inconvenient and unnecessary, or the person responsible for this horrendous crime was inside the store all along. But here's the kicker. The smaller footprints found at the scene matched Brittany's shoes, whereas the other print was larger and belonged to a shoe size 14. Now, this could have been one of the assailant's shoes, but the police weren't done looking. They referenced the bigger footprints with those given by the walkers in the CCTV footage, and they didn't match. Turns out that the larger footprint belonged to a size 14 shoe that was store property, and it was recovered in the search. And this detail was very strange. Even if Brittany's story was true and the two male suspects attacked them, why would they change out their shoes and wear ones from the store? It's just very bizarre. If that wasn't enough, on the night of the attack, the neighboring Apple store heard noises coming from the Lululemon at around 10.30 p.m. The workers and the security guard, Ricardo, distinctly heard two women having an altercation, and one was repeatedly heard saying, talk to me, don't do this, what's going on, please talk to me. Following this, they heard a scuffle, banging, and strange sounds as if something was getting dragged. All that time, they didn't ever hear a man's voice. And if that wasn't eerie enough, all this ruckus was followed by a weak voice saying, God, please help me, please help me. What was so infuriating was that the Apple Store workers thought that this was just store drama and they did nothing about it. If they'd called the police right then, maybe Jaina could have been saved, but they didn't and they were unaware of the fact that Jaina was fighting for her life on the other side of the wall. Anyway, in light of all these discoveries, police knew that there was something that Brittany wasn't telling them, and her story didn't match the actual events of the crime scene. Detectives couldn't help but raise questions like, why would Brittany lie about being violated by someone? What was she hiding? Was Brittany really in danger, or was she the danger? While digging into Britney's past, there's one particularly odd detail about her that continues to pop up. She had sticky fingers. In college, Britney was a frequent shoplifter. Her teammates, roommates, and even friends reported that things like money, makeup, and clothes would go missing in Britney's presence. When Britney's kleptomania forced her friends to report her, Britney eventually lost her scholarship and was expelled. By 2007, Britney moved to Maryland and worked at a hotel before getting promoted to a managerial position but that didn't last long either, as she was fired when coworkers found out that she was stealing from them. Brittany had aspirations to become a personal trainer and open her own gym. In fact, her job at Lululemon was just a stopover while she continued to pursue her dreams of opening, or at least working at a gym. From the looks of it, it didn't seem as though Jaina or Brittany were close, nor did it seem as though they had any issues with one another. They worked with one another and were cordial, and that's about it. So what happened on the night of the 11th of March, 2011, that led to Jaina's horrific passing? Well, before closing time, all the employees had to go through a mandatory bag check. This was part of Lululemon's protocol to prevent employees from stealing. Well, Jaina was in charge of checking Brittany's bag, and when she did, she was shocked by what she discovered. Jaina had found a pair of leggings with the tags still on them, leading her to believe that Brittany was shoplifting on the clock. Although she said nothing to Brittany, Jaina did call her manager and let her know about the incident. The manager assured Jaina that she would deal with Brittany tomorrow. And Brittany must have caught wind of this and maybe wanted to request Jaina to not say anything, although the deed was already done. Fast forward to closing time at 9 p.m. and Brittany called Jaina back to the store under the pretense of getting her Metro card from the store. It's believed that the women talked for a bit in the store with Brittany begging Jaina not to report her for theft. When Jaina stood her ground, it was the last straw for Brittany because she didn't want to lose another job. This was probably the issue that escalated into a verbal and then physical altercation, 
and Brittany, apparently having no other way out, could only think of ending Jaina's life so that she wouldn't get caught and fired from her job for stealing. It was now believed that Brittany viciously attacked Jaina with the tools, all while Jaina was trying her hardest to reason with Brittany and get away. But after tragically ending Jaina's life, Brittany proceeded to move Jaina's car out of sight, leaving behind trails of evidence. According to a witness, he saw Brittany sitting in the car on March 11th, and almost an hour and a half later, when he passed the same area, she was still seated in the same spot. It's believed that Brittany came up with the whole robbery gone wrong ruse during this time and went back in and ransacked the place while wearing size 14 shoes, leaving footprints all around the store. She then took the money from the registers and stashed herself and Jaina away in one of the back rooms. In the end, she injured herself with minor cuts on her body and face, tied her own hands and feet with zip ties, and waited for the next morning, when Rachel and Ryan discovered the brutal scene. This was an elaborate plan made by Brittany. And it's so chilling to think about someone who can resort to violently taking another person's life to save themselves from getting caught stealing merchandise. Jaina lost her life because Brittany was about to lose her job. On March 18th, 2011, just seven days after the gruesome attack on Jaina, Brittany was arrested. But there was a problem. The prosecution had to prove that Brittany had premeditated the whole thing, as they were hoping for a life sentence. In contrast, the defense was hoping for second-degree charges with a much lesser sentence. The jury consisted of six men and six women, and the case went to trial in October of 2011. Montgomery County's top prosecutor, John McCarthy, stated that Brittany was a cunning woman and a pathological liar. He also tried to convince the jury with a mountain of evidence and the loops in Brittany's story to sentence her for life, claiming she was a danger to society. The defense, on the other hand, stated that Brittany did end the life of Jaina, but it wasn't premeditated. Rather, it was a moment when Brittany apparently snapped and resorted to ending the life of Jaina. But the thing is, Brittany could have stopped at any moment after she supposedly snapped out of it, but she proceeded to attack Jaina, who was very sadly alive until the very last moment, and even tried to call for help and escape. Just the sheer brutality of this crime proves that this crime was certainly premeditated. All eyes were on the jury, who deliberated for just a single hour and returned with the verdict that Brittany was in fact guilty in the first degree. Brittany's sentencing was held in January of 2012, and she was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. At the sentencing, Judge Robert Greenberg defined Brittany's crime and violence as cold-blooded, calculated, deliberate, and malicious. He also added Brittany directly stated her actions to be terrorizing. In response to the Apple Store workers' impassiveness, when they practically heard a distressed Jaina pleading for help, Judge Greenberg remarked their failure as callous indifference. In 2015, Brittany exhausted all of her options for appeal, and she remains incarcerated at the Maryland Correctional Institute for Women in Jessup. Jaina's parents, David and Phyllis, as well as her brother Hugh, were relieved after the sentencing of Brittany. The Murray family also made a Facebook page in memory of Jaina, reliving the cherished moments of a cheerful, life-loving, and adventurous soul. The purpose of the Facebook page is to encourage people to try something new, something challenging, and live their lives the same way Jaina lived hers, freely and happily. This case definitely took an unexpected turn. Jaina, a woman who always went out of her way to help people, met her tragic end at the hands of someone she was just trying to help. Jaina's only fault, if you could call it that, is that she stood her ground and wasn't willing to let a thief get away with their crime even if she had to fight to the very end. Thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of True Crime Stories. If you enjoyed this video, check out this other interesting case I covered, and don't forget to subscribe. It's totally free and keeps you up to date with all of my future videos. You can also click that join button below to help support the channel and see new videos long before everyone else does. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.